us up live, our camp series. Michelle and I have missed y'all. We have um, Dr. Blanche Walter, senior clinician hematologist from the NIH with us to discuss Hematology 101 tonight. Yes, Nicole and I missed all of you so very much. It's been kind of a weird couple weeks and it's been a little bit different and I know it's not just for us, it's kind of everywhere. So we're excited to get this camp series started. We know everyone is kind of bumming about camp for obvious reasons. We're bumming about uh, missing our friends, missing everything. So we wanted to bring a little taste of camp to everyone. So the cool thing about doing this virtually is that anybody can log on. So camp normally maxes out of anybody. families. So now you could forward this on to your teachers, your parents, um, therapists, anyone that might find this helpful, you can share this. Um, please don't post any personal questions on tonight. We'll be answering your questions live though after Dr. Alter's um, presentation. Yes, and we are, um, this is, I think, a really great intro to the camp where um, it's kind of the basics of hematology that we're going to go over, which is one of the, the main foundations of what Schwachman Diamond Syndrome is typically. Um, so I know this is always a welcomed session for new families, for old timers who want to feel like they're, you know, catching up. If we always love the input of, of veteran families in the comment section helping us through this because yeah. we've all seen it and some of us have seen different sides of it. So, so as you're logging on, you're on here. let us know where you're logging on from. We love seeing where everyone's logging on from around the world. Um, again, we took a little break. We wanted to um, give you guys a break and um, then introduce our camp series. Um, so we will not be having camp, like a traditional camp, five days or four days and a lot of different hours. We understand everyone's working and may not have child care, so we will be doing one session at a time. Yes, that we hope it will make it easier. That way you can not only watch live as they go, but then also going back saying, oh, what did they say in that one session? And you can go back to the YouTube and find the old one and um, yeah. These will be uploaded on YouTube and um, subtitles will be uh, added and you can translate into your native language. Yes. And also we are working on a podcast. I actually found the basis that I needed to get that started this week. So we're pretty excited. Um, Lily asked, how do you get into the virtual camp? Welcome. You're here. You made it. <laughs> You're right you are here. here. <laughs> you are right here with us. And we're going to, Nicole and I have talked about doing some different things for the kids because we know they're going to feel like they're missing camp. Um, so we welcome any and all suggestions you guys have for what you want to see from this. This is for you, Nicole, and right. I do this for everyone else. So, so we want to introduce Dr. Alter. Um, Dr. Alter's son, people. Hi, Dr. Alter. Welcome. She is very busy this week. She's been in a couple of conferences, and we appreciate her time. Hi, Dr. Alter. I'm going to try to, ooh, what was that? Uh, how do I share my slides? There we go. Uh, okay, come on. Okay, so can you see my slides? I can see a blue screen where I think your slides are supposed to be. You can't see the slides. Let's see. The, fir the first slide yeah, says yeah. Hematology 101. If Nicole and I go down. Can you see it? Not yet. Hmm. I went on to share screen and then I did full screen. When you hit parts. share screen, did you hit share a tab or share your entire screen? I have no idea. Let me go back and see. Uh, I hit something that said screen. Is that what I should do? Um, I, I have only two choices. I have camera and I have screen. Let me see. So when you hit screen, um, and it should say share your screen, I would click. Um, I just uh, hit screen and nothing's happening. 
Oh, there it goes. So now it took your screen down. No, it says my screen share has been removed by the host. That's okay. That's okay. So, so try to hit screen again. Nothing is happening. And when you hit screen, it says waiting to go live. Okay. So that means Orva is going to have to push it up, which is okay. Well, I don't have my slides yet. I. Okay. It's okay. We have a very patient audience. They've seen us through some really, really, really shaky shows. They know, they know that this whole telehealth is kind of new for everybody. So, Doctor Walter, tell us about your shirt. Can't see your shirt. My shirt says, "No one wants advice, only corroboration." That's perfect. It's a John Stein Steinbeck Museum, and I always wear it the first day of every camp. Doctor Walter, can you tell us how you got into this line of work? Who's asking? Nicole. Nicole. Oh, right. So um, this is called Schwachmann Diamond Syndrome. And when I did my hematology fellowship in Boston, one of the people who was actually just retiring was named Lou Diamond. And I was the first year fellow and he assigned me to follow all his patients. Wow. So I sort of inherited them. And then I have another story, which is, I forget where the meeting was. It might've been the one in St. Louis where it used to be called Schrockman syndrome. And I'm infamous in some circles for saying, put the diamond back in Schrockman diamond syndrome. Because Schrockman was, so we're still not getting my slides I see, but anyway, um, Schrockman was a gastroenterologist in Boston and Lou Diamond was the hematologist. And Schwachman ran the cystic fibrosis clinic. And he noted that some of his patients who had uh, pancreatic insufficiency had low neutrophil counts. So he sent his fellow, Conti Ka, to see Lou Diamond's fellow, Frank Oski. And somehow it's named Schwachman Diamond instead of and Wallace I wondered about that. I love that backstory. A lot of people don't well, know that backstory. I only tell it every two years. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. So, I think the girls are going to help you again. So I think try to, when you hit screen, do you see one after you, um, do you see, are your screens on like a separate platform, like a, like a, a Microsoft Excel uh, sheets or no, are they on another no. tab in your Chrome? Now the, the screen, I, I can't hit it. it. It was yellow before, but now it is not. The only thing that's yellow is camera. We're already on that. My slides so, are a um, PowerPoint. Okay. And uh, But I don't want to, it's, it's shrunk at the moment until I know that it'll show because Otherwise, uh, if I go to the PowerPoint, uh, which seems to have, wait a minute, that's Ola, never mind. There we are. Now, can you see my slides? Um, well, so you have to hit share, you have to hit the screen. You have to make it yellow again. You have to click it yellow. Wait a minute. I did that. It's not and yellow. Because it, it got removed that one time, so you have to click it again. It's the, the, the thing to hit that says screen is not, oh, here we go. Share your screen. Share. Perfect. No, I can't because the only thing that's highlighted is cancel. I can't, the share is grayed out. It says choose what so I'd like. To, oh, okay. So, so when you get to that screen where it says share and cancel, you yep. have to highlight one. So you have to see the one that has your screen on it. And I would go over to the second tab that says your entire screen. Okay. And I cannot see my slides. Because they're still shrunk. Right. So hit that screen and now then hit share. Wait a minute. Let's hit screen again. I'm sorry. Um, You're okay. You're, You're doing great. Fine, Dr. Alter. It says I'm sharing. Can you see it now? I can't see it yet. Yeah. 
Yes. Can you see it now? Yeah. We sure can. So Nicole and I are going to go ahead and mute ourselves, and you've got the floor. Thank you very much. Okay. So, why do I call it Hematology 101? I usually have to explain this to people from other than the US, which is that a beginning course in university would be Hematology 1. But because everybody attending this knows something about it, it's a more advanced course, which is called 101. That's an American university trick, I'm sure. Now, in medical school, we were told when you hear hoofbeats, what do you think of? You think of something common like a horse. But if you're dealing with something that is not that common, then you start thinking about a zebra. And then if it's really rare, we go on from zebras to something even more rare, which are unicorns. Now this is not a real unicorn, but it has, it's an oryx animal with a very straight horn. So in profile, it looks like a unicorn. Uh, now, I think I showed this a couple of years ago, but it's a good introduction to genetics. You notice in these pictures of uh, antelope in Africa, there's a black one, and the black one comes up about one in four, and it's called a melanotic. The, uh, the deer is called a springbok. This is called melanotic or black. So what is the explanation for the melanotic animal? Well, this is great if I were in person because I'd be looking around for somebody to raise their hand. But since I filled the screen, uh, you're lucky you don't have to do that. The explanation is uh, that one in four of the births is melanotic, which means it's an autosomal recessive or AR gene that has gotten into the population at some point. Uh, now, it's not so uncommon because there are many species that have melanotic animals. So this is my backyard squirrel, and this is his friend, the melanotic squirrel, uh, who comes by about once a day, whether this guy I can't get rid of. Okay, what does autosomal recessive mean? Well, I don't know the actual carrier frequency of schwachmann diamond syndrome. So I'm going to leave that questionable, although I know there have been some speculation. But in any event, uh, if there's an individual who has Schwachmann, it means they got a mutated gene from each of their parents. And the parents are what we call carriers or heterozygotes. They're, they've got one mutated gene and one normal gene. So if they were to have four children, uh, and they were to statistically fall into place, one child, one in four, would have gotten a mutated gene from each parent. One in four would get a normal gene from each parent, and the other two would get a mutated gene and a normal gene from each parent. But uh, one of the things that is a little hard to grasp is that just because it's one in four doesn't mean if you've had a child with Schwachmann that the next three will not have the syndrome. And I've had physicians who had a little tr trouble grasping this because it's something called wishful thinking. So the affected child then, as you see, got two mutated genes. Uh, now, if the, the person with Schwachmann has a child, they'll pass on one mutated gene and then the other gene their child gets will come from the other parent who presumably doesn't have Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome. And so therefore they are an obligate carrier, just as the parents of the, the biologic parents of the child are obligate carriers. All right, let's turn to blood now. It's really easy. Red cells, white cells, and platelets, which are little blue things. So that's all we have to know. And it's really easy for us to teach students about blood. Now these tubes are what are called hematocrits. I have no idea why they are called that. Uh, the other name for them is Wintrobe tubes. So Max Wintrobe, one of the uh, founding fathers of hematology must have somehow created them. But in any event, if you take blood, this is the old way of doing it because I know you all get your crit from your doctor, but you don't get it this way. The old way was to put it in these tubes 
and spin it down. And the tube conveniently is, has a mark for 10, which is really 100%. So here we are, the red cells are slightly under 50% of the total volume of the blood. Uh, and that's a normal hematocrit. Uh, here's an anemia due to hemorrhage, anemia due to iron deficiency. Notice that the plasma, which is the top, is lighter here. Uh, here's somebody with leukemia where the white cells, which are lighter than the red cells, so the red cells go to the bottom, the white cells sit on top, but there's a lot of them in leukemia. Uh, if there's hemolysis, then the plasma gets this yellowish tinge from, from the uh, hemoglobin that's spilling out. Uh, and then here's uh, vitamin B12. This is called polycythemia vera. They have a too high a hematocrit. Now, I'm going to show you in a minute what we see more or less for the hematocrit now. This is a blood smear. We call, we call it a smear because we smear the cells onto the slide. The Brits are more polite and call it a film. They layer it on a film. A smear has some implication of not being so great, but in any event, that's what we call it. The red cells with the stain that is used turn orange, and they have what's called an area of central pallor. Think of trying to take a balloon that isn't quite full and lying it down. It sinks down and the middle, uh, it pushes whatever there is inside out to the edge. So that's these are essentially normal red cells. Uh, the white cells shown by the arrow, there's two different types. One is a lymphocyte for the immune system, and the other is a granulocyte, polymorphonuclear leukocyte, PMN, hypersegmented, whatever you want to call it. This is what's low in Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome. And then this is a different kind, probably a monocyte. The platelets are these little purple things. They are the cytoplasm. So a cell has a nucleus, which is a dark blue, and a cytoplasm, which takes on the color of what's ever in it. The platelets are actually only the cytoplasm from a cell in the bone marrow called a megakaryocyte. And so it, the, somehow the cytoplasm of the megakaryocyte fragments into these platelets. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute what all these cells do. Uh, this is an aplastic anemia blood smear. What's missing? Most of, uh, most of the white cells are a residual lymphocyte. Uh, it's hard to find platelets, although I know, here we go. Every time I show this slide, some wiseacre says, there's a platelet in there. Um, there's also some variation in the red cell size. This is what we call a macrocyte, a big red cell. This is sort of a teardrop or a daprocyte. Um, so that when, when the red cells have different shapes, we call it uh, poikilocytosis, and when they're different sizes, it's anisocytosis. You don't really have to know these terms. Uh, and this is a fairly anemic red cell. It's got a big area of central pallor, so it's got less hemoglobin than some of the others. So what do red cells do? They contain a red pigment called hemoglobin, which carries oxygen from the lung to other tissues that need it, namely the muscles, liver, kidney, heart, brain, and everything else. And they live about four months, 120 days. Uh, that's pretty long, which is why if you need red cell transfusions, you don't need them every day. Uh, there's a new term, another term called a reticulocyte, which is um, a newly made red cell. And it contains this reticular or lacy stuff inside, which is actually RNA. So the nucleus has DNA and it makes RNA and then that makes protein. And the newly re released cell has lost its nucleus, but it's still got some of the RNA. And that's the old way of staining for it. Now there are machines that can do this, but that's what it actually looked like. Uh, I'm also uh, interested I'm in something called fetal hemoglobin. It's the version of hemoglobin protein that the fetus has. And at birth, it switches over to the adult version by activating a different gene. 
but this stain described by doctors Kleihauer and Betke happens to stain very dark when there's fetal hemoglobin and very light when it's adult hemoglobin. So it's used primarily to identify a fetal maternal hemorrhage at birth, uh, but we've used it in the past because patients with marrow failure syndromes, SDS being one of them, uh, don't turn off their fetal hemoglobin totally. So that's a, that's a research thing. It's useful in telling whether a patient has one of the syndromes, but it doesn't tell you which one. Okay, platelets have the function of helping blood to clot. They live between seven and 10 days. So if somebody needs platelet transfusions, they get them once or twice a week. If the platelets are low, there may be bruising, petechiae, which are those tiny red dots under the skin. They can have nosebleeds or even internal bleeding, which is of course the most serious. Um, so that the other word for that is thrombocytopenia. And you may know the term thrombus as a clot. A thrombocyte is something that can help make a thrombus or a clot. So that's another word for platelets. Uh, so amongst the white cells, we have, as I mentioned, two kinds, the lymphocytes, and they'll not live for months to years. So if a woman has given birth to a male child and there was a little bit of baby blood that leaked over, she could have his lymphocytes, XY, uh, as late as 25 years later. I don't know if anyone's looked any longer. The other kinds of white cells are the phagocytes. Phago meaning they eat. Ooh, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, so the neutrophils live a matter of hours. Monocytes live a matter of days. Eosinophils and basophils also a matter of hours. So if you have neutropenia, uh, we don't usually try to give neutrophil transfusions, although that can be done if somebody has a serious infection, but they're not going to last very long. Now, what do they do? Uh, okay. Neutrophils eat bacteria and fungus. Lymphocytes kind of tell the other cells what to do and make antibodies. Whoops. Ooh, I don't know how to go back. So um, there we go. Uh, monocytes eat particles that are coated with antibodies and eosinophils and basophils show up when there are allergies. Neutrophils, as I oh, I'm sorry, it's just going to have to ring. Um, as I mentioned, they have many names. The immature ones are called bands because the segmented uh, nutri uh, nucleus looks more like one piece, one big band. They can be called juveniles, they're early forms. They are the, the first line of defense against bacterial infection is skin, lining of the mouth, throat, and intestines. The second line is the neutrophils, which eat the bacteria and kill them. And a low number of neutrophils will increase the susceptibility to infections. Uh, this was taken, it's another slide from the uh, American Society of Hematology slide bank, just showing you what they look like uh, in a more realistic form. These little purple dots are uh, enzymes in the cytoplasm, and the dark purple is the nucleus. Now, lymphocytes, oh, excuse me. I've got phones ringing all over the place. They'll just have to wait. Um, lymphocytes regulate other white cells. Hang on. Okay, sorry. Um, lymphocytes regulate other white cells and they make antibodies. And proteins that act as flags, that can act as flags to stick to bacteria and viruses, and um, that makes the antibodies and then they can tell other cells to eat everything that's coming by. Phagocytes are, as I mentioned, the type that eat, and the monocytes, there's one mono because it's one nucleus, 
uh, can turn it. Oh, God. Um, and there's cells that eat particles that are tagged with antibody. And there's a picture of a bacterium tagged with an antibody. Now, this is the old style machine where you drew the blood, it went into the machine, a little piece was taken into the machine, and it came out with what's called the CBC, the complete blood count. And this just shows you, uh, I've been in the business even since before 85, 1985, but this is the old lab slip, was what it used to look like. We'll give you the white cells, the red cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, uh, the mean cell volume, which is the size of the red cell, mean cell hemoglobin, mean cell hemoglobin concentration, and the RDW, the red cell distribution width, which tells you whether the red cells are all the same size or different sizes. And there's a platelet count and the size of the platelet, MPV. Most of what you see now comes on a printout from a computer uh, that is next to the machine that was doing the analyses. But these are these are the old ones, and it's probably clearer because they came along with the normal expected values as well. So red cells um, are measured by the hemoglobin, HGB, and it's usually in normal adults between 12 and 15 grams per 100 mils or gram per deciliter, but it may be lower in children. It's age-dependent. The hematocrit, as I said, I showed you the way we spin it down. Well, now the machine takes the hemoglobin, measures it, measures the mean cell volume, and mean cell hemoglobin, mean cell hemoglobin concentration, and calculates a hematocrit, which is why anybody who sees me knows that I'm not so interested in hearing what the hematocrit is, because that was calculated. I want to know the real measured value, which is the hemoglobin. But the hematocrit is normally <clears throat> 35 to 45%. OK. And anemia is often referred to as a low H&H, &H, low hemoglobin and low hematocrit. Platelets are usually 150 to 400,000. Uh, it depends. Those of you who may have come to the NIH have watched their normal value grow. It used to be anything over 140,000. Now their lower limit of normal is 170,000. It's important, whatever you measure, wherever it's measured, to compare it with the normal for that machine. Uh, thrombocytopenia, remember I said platelets are called thrombocytes, means low platelets. Penia meaning low, cytocell. White cells, leukocytes, the normal count is 5,000 to 10,000 or 5 to 10,000 per microliter. Um, the differential is a percent of all these different kinds. And so I'll let you think about what the ANC is, the absolute neutrophil count, um, but it's calculated by taking the white count times the percent neutrophils, that gives you the ANC or the absolute number because we have an absolute number here of 5,000, 30% are neutrophils, so 1,500 is the ANC. Normal is above 1,500. Anything above 500 is probably okay. Low is 200 to 500, and very low is very low. So neutropenia means a paucity of, or a shortage of, or a low number of neutrophils. So the CBC is a quick and easy assessment of numbers of blood cells. It's relatively inexpensive. Most, many doctor's offices keep the machine in their own office rather than having to send it out. From my perspective, no single test tells us more about a blood disorder, except maybe letting me look at the slide and look at the shape of the cells. It measures all three cells at one time, and it gives us a bunch of other valuable details. Now, what is anemia caused from? This is really easy. If you don't make enough red cells, you're anemic because you have decreased production and therefore decreased reticulocytes, which are the, low num the new numbers. Or in anemia, you can have an increased destruction, hemolysis. 
then the reticulocytes roar up and increase because the marrow can make cells, but they're being destroyed. Or if you're bleeding, the reticulocytes are increased. So in addition to the CBC, the reticulocyte count is really helpful. And in schwachmann diamond syndrome, it's, the reticulocytes are probably on the low side. Now, aplastic anemia is pancytopenia, low numbers of all the cells due to decreased production, and usually associated with a bone marrow that is hypocellular, reduced number of cells. Leukemia is a malignant proliferation of immature cells, and myelodysplastic syndrome in the adult world has low numbers of cells but an increase in the cellularity within the bone marrow. So it's what I call ineffective erythropoiesis. They're working hard, but they can't do it. Now, many of you may have already seen what it looks like to have a marrow done on you or your child. So the aspirate needle is on the left, and that's the needle there. And this is the hub, and it goes in with something in the middle to make it easier to push it in. Then this part, the trocar, is pulled out and a syringe is attached and bone marrow is aspirated or sucked out and then it's put onto a slide. Uh, the biopsy has a longer needle with uh, a different kind of hub. You pull that out uh, and you pull out this center piece and then you twist everything and it cuts something so that you get an actual piece of bone marrow surrounded by bone, but it's very small. And I once asked somebody how big the biopsy should be. Well, this was somebody who's about six foot five inches and he looked at me, I'm five two. And he said, it has to be big, two and a half centimeters. Well, that's like an inch and a half. Um, we don't necessarily push for that in pediatrics because sometimes the bones are small. Okay. So these are preparations of slides. And here you see, shown by the arrow, a piece of bone marrow. Um, this would be an aspirate, but that's a center where bone marrow is made. A biopsy, this is normal. Now the pink on each side is actually bone because it's, remember, we've cut out a piece. This is magnified, obviously. And the cellularity is all the stuff here surrounding what look like holes. Well, these holes were actually fat, even in skinny people, but the fixative that's used dissolves out the fat. So we can look at this and estimate the cellularity. What per percentage of the total area has cells? And it looks like about 50% or half. So, um, this would be from a normal adult. The cellularity is usually 100% or close to it at birth. And on average, it drops about 10% per decade. So that's why I'm saying this must be from somebody who's about 40 or 50 years old. On the other hand, this is again, bone, and there's no marrow. The cellularity is less than 10% here because most, this is from someone who couldn't make blood, and so it's a plastic. I just want to point out over here, the slightly darker area, which is hard to see, that's a megakaryocyte, and here's another one. But it takes a pathologist to really pick those out. So a normal aspirate, if we smear it out and then stain it and look with a really high level microscope, these are all red blood cell precursors. And as they get older, the uh, nucleus shrinks, and so does the size of the cell. And then eventually, this, the nucleus will be extruded. It will come out, and then you're left with a red blood cell. But this is all within the bone marrow. These are white cells of varying kinds. This is probably what we call a plasma cell. It's related to the lymphocytes. These are lymphocytes, which have a one round nucleus. And here's a granulocyte or a PMN or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, this is more a band form and this one's almost ready to come out. 
Uh, and this is a bone marrow aspirate from an aplastic. And all you can see are lymphocytes and occasional plasma cell. And the old literature used to say that the plasma cells would be increased. Well, it's not that they're increased, it's that everything else has disappeared and now you can see them. So uh, the, tech, the terminology is important. And then this is an iron stain. <clears throat> and what happens is in patients who get a lot of transfusions, um, the red cells that are transfused into them are, are eventually uh, destroyed and they release the hemoglobin and the only thing left that the body can't handle is the iron and it can sit in the bone marrow. Um, so that's why if somebody's on chronic transfusions, we give them drugs called chelators, which can eat or chelator bind to the iron and remove it to prevent this from happening. Uh, and this is a leukemia bone marrow where you can see some red cell precursors, but the white cell precursors all look kind of similar and have rather large nuclei. Those are blasts. And then this is a better slide from the American Society of Hematology again, showing what those cells look like. So they're primarily, they're full of nucleus, very little cytoplasm, and they um, are leukemic cells. So hematopoiesis is a big word for saying production of hemato or hematology or blood cells. It's the formation and development of blood cells. It takes place in the bone marrow and it starts with stem cells that can then divide into everything else. So this is a complicated diagram and I'll show you something a little easier, but here's a stem cell and it branches off into the lymphocytes or everybody else. And the lymphocytes can make T or B cells. The B cells make immunoglobulins and the T cells have cellular ability to fight infections. The um, other lineage is called myeloid, which really should be restricted to the white cells. Uh, and here you have a variety of them, granulocytes, these are eosinophils. But then there's also a tree part of that coming off of that stem cell that becomes a red cell. And this is a little easier to swallow, if you will, because things are labeled and they're not out of focus. Um, so if you see again, the lymphocyte lineage, B cells and T cells, and then the rest of the lineage, which is primarily white cells, but also eventually leads to red cells as well. And some of this terminology is terminology stemming from what we can culture. So we go from a stem cell to progenitor cells, which we can look at in culture, which then mature into precursor cells, which mature into the terminal, terminally differentiated cells. Now, there's something in MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, which is well-defined in the adult world and not so well defined in uh, the SDS or other bone marrow failure syndromes. But there, we can certainly say, use the term dysplastic, meaning uh, looking different, as opposed to aplastic, meaning absent. And the cells have things that the, we can recognize under the microscope. Um, but what it means in each of the marrow failure syndromes, including SDS, uh, is still something of a research subject. The, that was the red cells. The myeloid or white cells have increased immature forms and too many or too few granules. And the megakaryocyte, as I mentioned, which is what makes the platelets, can have either one big nucleus instead of a multi-lobulated or too many lobes or be small or have different morphology, different appearance. Uh, so here are erythroid, and the striking feature here is what we call a binucleate cell. It's got two nuclei. Uh, they look like they'd add up to one. Uh, and here's a multinucleate uh, with about four lobes in obviously a red cell precursor. Uh, and then uh, the white cells um, <clears throat> may look funny, and this is an unusual looking megakaryocyte with Normally it should have about eight lobes that all look like that. And it's got these two that look okay, but then they've got 
maybe one, two, three or four that are different and clearly unusual. So the way hematopoiesis works is uh, you start from uh, very immature cells and they keep dividing and maturing and maturing until they're terminally differentiated. And there are a lot of cells that do this, but only a few of them can make it out. And then I just wanted to end up with the latest of uh, what we know about genes in Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome, which is that the majority of the patients, probably 90, 95%, have biallelic two mutations, one from each parent, in the schwachmann bodian diamond syndrome. I didn't mention Bodian. He, he's, a, I think he was an English, whoops, sorry, English pathologist. Um, but what the, there is a registry that Cass Myers and Akiko Shimomura are in charge of. And what they're finding is uh, that there are, there's a subset, a little piece of the pie, if you will, with some other genes. And there are patients who originally were called Schwachmann, but the gene couldn't be found. And now they're finding these other genes. And since they are a minority of the patients, uh, I don't think we know enough yet to say that they're clinically truly different from the classical patient, because there's a lot of heterogeneity or variation within any of the patients. And that's the end of my slides. Shall I stop? sharing them. I guess I will do that. Okay, I've stopped sharing. Thank you, Dr. Alter. That was a really good presentation. I think it was really helpful to those to start understanding um, the basics of the hematology okay. side of this. Yeah. I'm sorry for all the phone calls. <laughs> That's the best part. <laughs> it's, what is it? It's Sunday night. Uh, Dr. Alter, was that Dr. Fauci calling you? On not at all. I'm not on his email. <laughs> but uh, so I'm happy to take questions. Um, I know who it was because I looked at my phone. I should have kept it near me. Nope. And I'll call him back later. Dr. Alter, I have a quick question um, before we take viewer questions. You had um, started the show talking about um, cystic fibrosis and how SCS even came about and how they started seeing um, blood abnormalities in cystic fibrosis patients when you first started. Well, we didn't have cystic fibrosis. What it is, is uh, as many of you know, when, when your major problems are gastrointestinal, you attend a clinic that may be filled with cystic fibrosis people. Right. And it's because the pancreas is the exocrine pancreas, not the uh, part that caused diabetes, is not working in either of those disorders, but they're totally unrelated, except okay. by going to the same doctor. Right. Do you have a theory of what's going on with the clinical patients based on like your history of what's happened with like cystic fibrosis and... I'm sorry, what do you mean what's going on with them? Um, well, with cystic fibrosis. I mean, so either one, whether whether if you have pancreatic insufficiency, whether it's due to cystic fibrosis or SDS, it can be helped by taking the enzymes. Right. Okay. Well, the well, other well, thing, well. let me just mention something that I forgot to mention on the last slide. We have at least one, maybe two patients who were called SDS in whom we initially could find only one gene to be mutated. And the genomics, informatics, fancy names for the genetic studies are really tricky. And some patients have what's called a mutation and there are a couple of common mutations. Yeah. And every once in a while there's a patient, remember the DNA, you can now see me, is a string, but they had a deletion a huge deletion missing most of the gene. So when sequencing occurred, they couldn't find out what it was, but right. there are a few ways to find that. So if there are any patients in your group who have one of the classical Schwachmann mutations and their other one has not been identified, it can be if you join the registry or join our cohort study at the NIH. I love that you mentioned the registry towards the end. I was secretly fist pumping back here because we we want everyone on the registry. I, the most beautiful part about this show, I think, is 
Um, Nicole has a, a genetically diagnosed child. I have a clinically diagnosed child. I have a child with one gene and they can't quite find that other missing part of it. And so we can see things from two totally different viewpoints on how things are happening. And it's interesting. Well, Michelle, I have to mention, I don't know what they're doing in the registry for informatics. I only know what we're doing. And I don't think you're in my study. I don't think I am, which was going to bring me to my second question. And I was hoping when we we're at camp this year, we'd actually be able to join your study because I know when I'm at camp, I'm more likely to sit and actually fill out the paperwork for things. Is there a simple way we can yes. share your study so people can yes. join? That's a slide, you know, because I'm involved in two meetings, I can't remember which slides are in which talk. No problem. I had a, t a slide in my, uh, in my <laughs> Fanconi talk. Um, it, you can call the 800 number. If you have anything to write it down on, 800. I'm watching Michelle look for something. I'm, I'm typing it into the chat so everyone can have okay, it. 518-8474. Yeah. And then a lovely young lady named Stephanie who is working five days a week. I'm not sure whether she's working from her home or for her office, doesn't matter. She'll take the information, she'll ask you a number of questions, which is the paperwork that Michelle was referring to, and then she will send that electronically to Dr. Neelam Geary, who works with me, who will review it. And then uh, when we meet as a group, again, which is electronic, we decide that that person warrants sending the next level of questionnaires. So we start with what we call the telephone screener, which is done in person if I hand it out. Um, but now it's done, as I say, by telephone. And then after we agree that the, we know what we think what the patient has or what we can do for them. Uh, oh, there it is. It's the little there button. There it is. Look at it. Oh, oh, we're up with the wizardry. I feel like I'm in Times Square. I've got this reading. <laughs> put around. Anyway. Welcome. Um, then after we accept someone into the study, we then send the next level of paperwork, which is called the family history questionnaire, in which we ask the family contact, who is usually the mother, although not 100%, to give us family history information. And that's because some of us are very interested in whether other members of the family might have either some symptoms of SDS or cancer or leukemia or other problems. And um, then when we see those forms, we decide who we need more details on. And then we send it to the family uh, coordinator who then uh, might have to fill out uh, individual medical history forms uh, which is okay and not so difficult for the children because you know all that. Uh, and then you hand it off to other members of the family, like the child's father or uh, siblings who are old enough to be able to help. But there's some questions on there for things like birth history and stuff, which only mama can provide. Uh, and yeah. then eventually uh, we also include a form for you to sign to give us permission to request medical records, uh, which we then um, uh, get from the institutions that have cared for the individuals. But we can't do that without that being signed. And unfortunately, if you take too long to do everything, by the time we get around to it, <laughs> did I ask for a show of hands? <laughs> <laughs> I'm that person. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, if you take too long, first of all, you forget. Sometimes people move or they bury it. I mean, I can't tell you how many things I've got buried under paperwork in my in my home office, uh, including things I lost. I thought I'd lost forever, and then I move a piece of paper, and there it is. Right. Um, but a anyway, treasure. Uh, well, it is because I've misplaced some things I really want. Um, <laughs> but I don't know where they are. Um, but anyway, if it's more than a year since you signed permission for us to get the records, it may have to be signed again. And certainly if the child was 17 and turns 18, because at 18, they have to sign their own. Interesting. Okay. 
So, and we are, we're not, the registry and our cohort are not really related. We don't share information. We do a lot of things on a research basis. So for example, like looking for the deletion in the gene that goes to a research lab after they identify it, then we get another sample of DNA and we send it to a lab that is clinically certified, CLIA certified. But uh, it's much less expensive to do things in research labs, at, at least at the NIH, because we don't pay nearly as much. Dr. Alter, we have to see the match on, so they have a registry. We're going to have SCS, the SCS registry on, so they have a registry. Can you tell us a little bit about your registry, specifically what you're looking for, and how it differs from the SDS registry? Well, first of all, mine goes back 20 years. That differs already because uh, the people who are doing the SDS registry started theirs maybe three or four years ago. Um, but because it's longitudinal, uh, we can track what happens to patients. Uh, so as I say, first of all, we probably cost less for the genomics. The second thing is when our doors are open, which is not quite yet, um, we can bring families to the NIH and we bring the whole family, not just the affected child, because one of the things we're trying to characterize in all these syndromes is, is there something associated with being a carrier rather than having the full-fledged syndrome? Okay. And the other thing is that our, our cohort is called the Inherited Bone Marrow Failure Syndromes Cohort. And we, include Fanconi anemia, dyskeratosis congenita, Schwarzman diamond, and diamond blackman, and um, a few others that are less common. But what it also permits us to do is in our own cohort, with our own labs, compare people with different syndromes. So for example, the specific test for, for Fanconi anemia is chromosome breakage. And until recently, we did that on everybody. So we could say, here's the sensitivity, here's the specificity. If you have Schwachmann, you will not have the kind of result as we see in Fanconi. But nobody else can do that unless they're seeing all the syndromes and doing it in all the same labs. Right. Uh, the Schwachmann group, um, we had been sending uh, the isoamylase and the trypsinogen to the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. I honestly don't know whether they're still doing it. I don't know what anybody's doing anymore. I don't think anybody, I don't think none of, we don't know what we're doing. Um, uh, I will say that if you signed up now, uh, at, oh, and we bring the whole family at the NIH's expense. We pay for the plane tickets, we put them up at the Children's Inn, we give them a per diem, and then of course we make them NPO so we can get the accurate studies, but we're not asking anybody to get on a plane right now. Yeah. So okay. do you advise people yeah. joining right now or wait till things get better with COVID? No, no, no. You've got to join now because it takes a long time to do the paperwork. Well, and first tell this is a good time to do it. Everyone tells us it's a good time to do it. You know, just do it because once you're in and once we can start getting your records, then we ask you if anything happens, if leukemia develops, or diabetes, or you go to transplant, we've already got the baseline stuff and we can just update our records. So for example, this is just totally anecdotal. Um, there are, uh, there's one Schwachmann patient who's had uh, a solid tumor. Um, and that doesn't mean it, it's associated with the syndrome. You know, one doesn't make it, but you have to have a large enough number. Yeah. Um, and the way that it was reported, actually, one of our own students misunderstood it and thought we had two patients, one who had leukemia and one who had a solid tumor. Well, it turned out that nobody had leukemia and one had a solid tumor. So uh, Dr. Geary and I, who uh, she's a staff clinician who's worked with me probably for 15 years now, um, but we've been known to sit and look at the records ourselves. And uh, for every time we've published um, our cohort a couple of times now, 
let me know if if you need me to send them to somebody and then you can distribute it. I'm not going to send it to everybody. Um, but we've yeah, written, great. we studied the co but but we've we've done it in the context of all four disorders. And we are comparing all four. And we don't see as many Schwachmann patients because uh, of the registry. And um, you know, it's it's cumbersome, but what we do that's different as I said, as we see the entire family. So for example, in some of the under dis other syndromes, we've identified what we would call a silent carrier. Somebody who actually has the genetic mutations, but doesn't have any of the symptoms or might get them later on. So um, that's a little bit what's different. A registry to me, if you Google the word, it means a list. And it's a list, except so I, I don't like it being called a registry because it's to me a, a, a cohort is people with something similar. It comes from the Roman cohorts, which was all the same soldiers who marched together uh, and invaded. So that's what a cohort is. It was called a cohort. So a cohort is to us people who meet our criteria, which are ever broadening as we get more genes. And I can't remember. We, I'm sure we, we might have patients with the more rare genes that I mentioned, but we don't have enough of them to say anything about whether they're really Schwachmann. We also have had in the past individuals who thought they had Schwachmann, and maybe they have one of these other genes at this point. I just don't yeah. know, because we're pretty stringent. And I've talked to Cass Myers and Akiko Shimura about it, when they're analyzing Schwachmann, they they separate out those with the genes proven, a, a proven mutations in both SBDS genes versus the other genes. Because if we have enough of them, eventually we may be able to clinically distinguish them. Yep. So we've done this in, for example, Fanconi anemia. There's one genotype, there's a couple of different genotypes that we can say, okay, if the patient looks like this, or if they have these kinds of complications, that's the gene, because there are 22 genes in Fanconi. Um, and we're doing that in the other syndromes, but uh, we, we need more numbers. Um, Joan asks, is your cohort studying the incidence of cancer and bone marrow failure patients and families? I'm sorry? Joan asks, is your cohort studying the incidence of cancer and bone marrow failure families and patients? Uh, yes. <laughs> no, it's that's sort of a garbled version of the title of our paper. That's why it took me a while to figure oh. it out. <laughs> okay. But because we are the NCI, uh, you know, I mean, our branch has myself, Neelam Geary, Sharon Savage, Pyle Kinsha, Lisa McReynolds um, and a couple of fellows, all of us trained in pediatric hematology. Everybody except me is trained in hematology oncology. I trained so long ago that I trained only in hematology and now I work at the Cancer Institute. But <laughs> yeah. no, certainly, so from the perspective of those at the Cancer Institute, the only in outcome of interest is the type and incidence of cancer. Um, but because we are there, we can do things easily that others have trouble doing. So every time we want to publish a paper or review our data, we create an Excel file with uh, a list of the patients and all of the different kinds of complications they may have had, focusing on cancer, if you will, and their age and dates and all the rest of this. And then we send it to a company that maintains what's called the SEER registry. It's the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results. And it tabulates the frequency and types of cancer in the general population. And it covers, uh, it's got about eight different centers and it covers the entire US representative regions. And then we can get the, the relative risk 
in our patients, let's say there are five patients with a certain complication, it adjusts for the age and the sex and the birth cohort and all does all this fancy stuff and says, okay, that's more likely to have occurred uh, and it's not just chance. So we have time for a couple more questions and there are some pretty good ones. So the first one is, can patients who've had a bone marrow transplant join your cohort? So absolutely, we want patients and this is with all the syndromes, whether or not they've had a transplant, whether or not they've had leukemia, whether or not they've had a solid tumor. We can't get good numbers and statistics if we exclude anybody. So one of the things we've seen again in Fanconi where we have the largest number that the uh, frequency of uh, certain kinds of cancer is actually higher in those who've had a transplant. And we're trying to figure out why. And we see similar data in dyskeratosis congenital, but we don't have enough patients in the other categories. Yeah. And do you, let me ask, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, do you guys have any idea what proportion of the patients you know of have had a transplant? Maybe Joan. Joan, I know Joan's watching. Oh, Joan, we're going to pass that baton to Joan to well, answer maybe that question. Well, maybe send it in by yeah, chat. Probably, uh, the registry might have that data the best, the SDS registry. But, so, so I'm going to give you a, a word you've heard called BIAS, B-I-A-S. And if we restrict our study to exclude anybody, it's biased. And, and the second part is, you may be biased to join a study if you have or have not had a complication. But it's called, you may be biased against studying just because our paperwork is too much or because it involves other members of the family. And we're sensitive to that. If, we, if you send us a family history questionnaire and tell us about all the aunts and uncles and all the other people, and then you say, do not contact this person, we won't. Okay, um, but this is the only way we can learn whether carrying the gene, for example, which the parents have, uh, has any health consequences. You know, people worry about it, and I don't want to put worries in your head, but I want to give you motivation <laughs> to join the study. And our study is divided into two categories. One is everybody who comes in is called the field cohort. You're out in the field. And that's everybody right now. And then the subset who we bring to the NIH are the CC, the clinical cohort, clinical center cohort. At the moment, that's zero. Okay. Everybody's in the field cohort. Um, if somebody lives close enough to Washington that they can drive instead of having to get on a plane uh, and are willing to, uh, you know, if it's really acute, we're not the right people. We are epidemiologists. We're studying the natural history. We don't have treatment protocols. If something happens and your child needs some treatment, you go to your own doctor. Right. But, um, and at the moment, the way anybody can get into the NIH, including me, is uh, I've gone a couple of times and I drive up to my garage and they ask some questions and they give me a mask and then I go in. Um, and that's true for patients as well. Anybody inside is now wearing a mask and lots of hand sanitizer and washing hands. So Definitely. unless, you know, since ours is an epidemiology natural history study, there's no reason to put anybody at risk. Absolutely. Okay. And the only times I've gone to the NIH, frankly, is to be tested, but otherwise I'm not there. They just started letting uh, some of the clinical doctors in and some of them are seeing patients. And um, again, it's people who live nearby. The question that came right after the, the first one was, and I'm, I'm sure the answer is gonna, you sort of already answered it a little. It says, are you interested in patients with no known genes or just those that have the known genetics? No, we, uh, we I recognize the name. Um, We'll, if the gene has not been identified, uh, then back when our, 
or in the future when our labs start working again, um, we will do what we can, but, but we do it on a research basis and that can take a while. Uh, and then we confirm it, as I said, in a clinical lab. So what we have done occasionally is identified somebody who thought they had any of the syndromes we study and eventually, sometimes years later, said, no, they don't. And so if somebody comes with symptoms that are consistent with Schwachmann, we call them SDS-like or Diamond Black Van DBA-like or Fanconi FA-like. And the reason we put the like on it is if they're clinically like that, then every time a new genomics build comes out, this is fancy terminology, we know to go look for the people, let's say it's a, it's a build looking for Fanconi, and we go looking for the likes as well and throw them in as well. So uh, the worst that happens is you make a phone call, you answer the five minutes to do the screener, we discuss it at a meeting, and we say, we don't know what's going on, but it's not one of the ones in our study. Or we say, it's close enough that we'll try to find the gene, and if we can't, we'll do what we can. Very cool. Awesome. Tamara Brown had asked, um, her son Corbin is seven, will be seven soon. He doesn't have any sickness like most SCS children I have seen. Will it get worse as he ages? Um, so sometimes what happens is, uh, remember, the, the, the usual immediate early symptom is malabsorption from the pancreatic insufficiency. And there's some data in some patients where the pancreatic enzyme concentrations in the serum actually increase with age. And so many children who have needed enzymes for their meals as a child may age and not need them or decide they can handle whatever the side effects are of not having them uh, because they're in school or whatever. So yeah, um, so the pancreatic part is not the least of the problems. And so the reason that you guys used to be called Schrockman syndrome was because the GI docs were the ones identifying you. And then when I showed up, I said, put the diamond back in Schrockman diamond because the diamond is the hematology part and that's what may get worse with age, whereas the absorption may not. Interesting. I know we have a lot of patients who have come off of enzymes as they get older, and then we're seeing um, them go back on them as teenagers for some reason, and they're not understanding why. But it's it's interesting to see the different curves and trends that are happening. Well, part of it may be that the young child who is toilet trained uh, just takes themselves off and does what they have to do. And then when they get to be teenagers and it's inconvenient, uh, suddenly they want some help. Yeah. Okay. So we once, when I was in New York, I was at Mount Sinai Hospital and Dr. Jeffrey Lipton, some of you may know that, uh, was there. And I was referred a patient uh, who was anemic. And uh, the patient was anemic. And Lipton walks in the room, takes a sniff. It's a little baby in diapers. And it turns out it was a Schwachmann diamond undiagnosed because they presented with anemia. And so nobody paid any attention to their white cells or the fact that they had uh, smelly frequent stools. Right. So, you know, the, this, it, it's the level of sensitivity of the family and of the doctors in terms of what age somebody's diagnosed. Yeah. I work with a statistician at the NIH and when we first started analyzing all our data, he said, well, we start the clock at the time they sign up for your cohort. I said, no, they have a genetic disease. They've had it from birth. <laughs> you know, we're just, if you start at the age they joined, you're measuring the sensitivity of the doctor, making the right diagnosis or making the referral. So, but they've had it from birth. Yeah, definitely. So much. Let me tell you, if there are more questions that come in, you can send them to me by email and I'll eventually answer them. Thank you, Dr. Alter. I think it sounds like a great plan. 
<laughs> we know that you've had a really busy week. I'm sure you need rest. Um, well, my other don't meeting. Let fall back, whoever's calling you. <laughs> well, fortunately, the meeting, uh, the Fanconi meeting, which goes on tomorrow, is on West Coast time. So it starts at 8 a.m. for them, but not till 11 a.m. for me. Oh, okay, that's oh, good. And now, and then. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, one last question before we leave you. Um, I was gonna ask, ask this, because I knew it was gonna be asked. So we have people logging in from all over the world. So we have someone from Denmark that just asked, um, are you accepting people from other countries? <laughs> so, well, when back when airlines were working, back when people would get on planes, uh, anybody from any continent other than North America uh, had to get themselves to the U.S. We we don't have government contracts of air for airfare from Europe, so it is a called a North, North American study. But uh, someone in Denmark could probably more readily go to the U.K. and see Alan Warren, uh, who studies Schwachmann. Uh, they could also go to Italy. And uh, well, again, nobody's going anywhere right now. Nobody's going anywhere. <laughs> Would you like them to sign up, and then when it when people are traveling again? Well, it makes sense to make contact yeah. because if the doctor you're contacting ends up having to be a consultant because they know more than your own doctor, uh, they need to have had time to learn about you and to get medical records in hand. Good advice. Yes. So don't procrastinate, because once we start seeing people, we're going to have a very long list. And I can speak from it. We've mentioned this when we had Be The Match on. When my son was first diagnosed, I joined the bone marrow registry, the neutropenia registry, the Schwarzman diamond syndrome registry, and I started doing paperwork as well. And then all the paperwork became too much, and I got very confused what was what on top of trying to learn the disease. Well, let me just say a word about bone marrow transplant, which is most of the transplant centers are electronically connected with all the databases. So I think if you need a transplant and have identified the place it's going to be done, they'll take care of reaching out to all the That's different true. registers. That's very true. Okay. But, you know, one of the things I, and I'll just say this, it's a bit of a COVID related statement, which is, only worry about things you can control. And so if you need to, you know, to um, find a match, that's up to the doctor. And you can help them if you have some relatives in some country who might be related, but basically delegate, let them do their job. And your job is keeping that child healthy I have one parent who said they were going to just wrap their kid in saran wrap and let them out 10 years from now. It's hard. It's hard not to do that. <laughs> it is. Well, but it's important. And in one of the other syndromes, I heard a mother say that their child who had been going to school was healthier than ever before because the child had not gone to school, had not had any contact with anybody with an illness didn't come home with a cold every week, that sort of stuff. So that's your job is to convince the child, and that's hard if they're a teenager, um, that they need to stay home and that if they go out, no matter what their age, if they're gonna be near anybody else, they've gotta wear a mask. And the hardest part that the young people and not your kids necessarily re don't realize is they say, you know, there've been all these riots all over the place, including here in Washington. And they just say, I'm not gonna get sick. But the point is there are what are called asymptomatic carriers. People who have no symptoms who carry the virus and may carry it home and give it to a vulnerable child or to a vulnerable older relative. So, we, you know, I'm getting really bored in my little downstairs. <laughs> Yeah, I but, can imagine. Yeah. But here we are. Yeah. Thank We're all doing you. great. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us tonight, Dr. Alter. We know you're really, really busy and you're really tired. You're a very in-demand woman and there's obviously a good reason for it. Well, as I said, the overlap is because the Fanconi really did camp. They did a three-day meeting. 
you guys are spreading it out. So I didn't put any slides in from camp, which I had in the Fanconi talk, but I would urge everybody who's not been there, look up campsunshine.org and look up the one in Maine because there are many of them. There's, there's one in Michigan, ironically well, enough. Place. Yeah, but it's not. No, not at all. Point, this is, no, you have to put Maine on if you do it search yes. because then you meet Nancy Sinclata and her husband, yeah. Andy Oakenfield, who's the camp doctor and me and all these others. We don't go to any of those other places. Yeah. And doctors don't go to them unless to take care of sick people. Whereas the model at this Camp Sunshine for all these syndromes is a series of doctors come through and give you lectures like you've heard today. So for example, I was supposed to be at Fanconi this weekend and then two weeks from now to be back at Camp Sunshine for uh, Schwachmann and then in September to be back again for another syndrome. None of them are happening. The camp is closed for the summer and the staff just last week were allowed to come back to their offices because I needed something. If those, some of you have been to camp, you know Beth and I needed something from her. And she emailed me and said, this is her first day back in the office. So, so just a reminder, we're doing virtual camp so as Dr. Alto just mentioned, Fanconi is having their camp as normal. We have chosen, we're gonna split everything up because we know that you guys don't have childcare and are working. So hopefully this model works best for you guys. Um, so we'll advertise the next speaker we have for camp and we will be having a lot of children's camp sessions for you guys as well. We've been talking to volunteers and we have some great ideas. So Dr. Alter, thank yes. you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm sorry we're not at camp. Yeah, Maybe next I know, year. I'm also Maybe sorry we're not at camp. Maybe next year. Get some rest, Dr. Alter. Everyone stay well. Wear your mask. Um, so <laughs> wear your mask, wash your hands. Yeah, no phone calls. <laughs> Thank, you, Alter. Thank you, Michelle. Well, and okay. thank you, Orva, behind the scenes. Thank you. Thanks yes, bye, all. guys. Good night. Bye. Good night. How do I get out of this? You'll just close it out. <laughs>